Longevity interventions, what works and what doesn't? To start, let's have a look at data for glycine, ergothionine, and nicotinamide riboside, or NR, supplementation in mice and their effects on longevity. But is there something better? And that something better may include bile acids. So first, does glycine supplementation extend lifespan? So here we're looking at data, survival data, for uh, females on the left and then males on the right. And notice that it says pooled females, and that's because data from three uh, different study sites, the Jackson Lab, University of Michigan, and University of Texas, so each of these sites conducted their own independent lifespan studies looking at glycine supplementation, and then this data, these two images, is the pool data from all three sites. So it's essentially a meta-analysis for the effect of glycine supplementation on longevity. So glycine supplementation was started at nine months in both the male and female mice. And then when looking at median survival, so this is 50% survival, this is the time when half the colony has died and half is still alive, we can see that glycine supplementation increased, significantly increased lifespan, median lifespan by 4% in females. So what about maximum lifespan? So this is 10% survival, this is the time when 90% of the colony has died and 10% is still alive. So in the female mice, glycine supplementation did not extend maximal lifespan. All right, what about the data in males? So first, median survival, we can see that Glycine supplementation significantly increased median survival in the male mice by 6%. And similarly, for maximum survival, also a significant 6% increase for glycine supplementation. So from this, we can see that glycine extends lifespan in mice. So what about in people? Now, if glycine contributes to longevity in people, I'd expect that long-lived people would have relatively higher blood levels of glycine. So is this true? So here we're looking at blood levels of glycine in people that were in the 94 to 105 year old age range, so they had an average age of 97 years, and then their offspring, which were in the 50 to 79 year age range, and that, an, that had an average age of 67 years. And when comparing the older versus the younger group, we can see that blood levels of glycine were 10% higher. So is this statistically significant? And in this case, this is when the p-value is less than 0.05, and the false discovery rate, FDR, which is an extra level of statistical rigor, is also less than 0.05. So in both cases, we can see that the p-value is less than 0.05 and the FDR is less than 0.052. So this is a 10% increase in four blood levels of glycine in the 97-year-olds when compared with the younger age group. So from this, we can conclude higher blood levels of glycine in long-lived people. So next up is ergothionine, and I've already presented this data in, a, in an earlier video, so I'll, that data will be in the right corner if you're interested in seeing the full story. So I'm only gonna present a little bit of the ergothionine data. So this is uh, uh, survival curves for ergothionine supplementation in fruit flies. So this is the Canton S uh, strain for fruit flies, and this is uh, data in females. So when looking at median survival, again, 50% survival, we can see that three different concentrations of ergothionine supplementation in flies significantly extended median lifespan. So what about on a different strain of flies? And in this case, that different strain is the YW strain, and again in females. So when looking at median survival, we can again see two different uh, concentrations of ergothionine, EGT on the right, significantly it's extended uh, lifespan. So from this, we can conclude that ergothionine extends lifespan in flies. And that data doesn't yet exist yet in mice or other mammals. Uh, so we'll have to keep our eyes open for when those studies are eventually published. So what about in people? Will uh, ergothionine extend lifespan in people? Now, if ergothionine promotes longevity in people, I'd expect, again, relatively higher blood levels in the long lived. So for that, we go back to, to, to see if this is true, we go back to that earlier study that I showed on the last slide for glycine, and now we're looking at ergothionine, ergothionine levels in blood. So first, in the 97-year-olds, when compared with the 67-year-olds, we can see that the older group had a 40% reduction for blood levels of ergothionine, and this reduction is significant, meaning the p-value and FDR are both less than 0.05. So in this case, blood levels of ergothionine are not higher in long-lived people. So that kind of argues against them having a potential role on longevity in long-lived people. Now, note that uh, it also raises a question, would increasing dietary ergothionine in long-lived people further improve longevity? And there's no data yet to, see, uh, to test that, so we'll have to stay tuned for those studies. All right, third on this list is nicotinamide riboside, or NR. So again, here we're looking at pool data for females on the left, and this again is in mice. Uh, and this is again from uh, pool data from three sites, the Jackson Lab, University of Michigan, and University of Texas. And I should note that this data is from the interventions testing program. And one reason why they're considered the gold standard for lifespan studies is because 
uh, they, they do you know, independent testing at multiple test sites and then pool that data. So again, it's like looking at a meta-analysis of uh, supplements uh, and their potential effects on lifespan. So uh, note that supplementation with NR was 1,000 parts per million, and it was started in youth at eight months of age for both the female and male mice. So uh, in terms of NR, we're looking at the pink triangles, and then when looking at median survival for both the female on the left and male on the right uh, mice, we can see that NR did not have an effect on median lifespan in either female or male mice. All right, what about maximum survival? Again, 10% survival, 90% of the colony uh, died, was already dead, and 10% was still alive. So similarly, no effect on maximal survival for NR supplementation in either female or male mice. Now note that there's a lot of data on uh, these lifespan curves, so it's kind of hard to see uh, because there's so much overlapping data. So let's take a look at the actual numbers. So here we're looking at median lifespan, and first starting with the data in females, we can see that median lifespan for the control-fed mice was 874 days, and for nicotinamide riboside supplemented female mice, it was 875. But uh, that p-value is 6.12, 0.612, so we can see that median lifespan was not different for the NR supplemented female mice when compared with controls. Similarly for the male mice, uh, controls lived 787 days, a median lifespan, NR supplemented mice lived 763 days, and that too, that difference is not significant as indicated by the p-value of 0 0.25. All right, in terms of maximum lifespan, so 90th percentile, 10% uh, survival uh, for controls, uh, the female controls, they lived, uh, had a maximum lifespan of 1,047 days, and although the NR supplemented female mice lived 1,068 days, that, that wasn't a significant difference, as you can see by the p-value of 0 0.99. And then similarly for the male mice, maximum lifespan, not different as you can see by the uh, 1,047 days for the controls, 1,019 for the NR supplemented mice. But again, the p-value is 0 0.99, not even close to statistically significant. So NR does not extend lifespan of mice. Now, based on these data, the expectation would be that long-lived people do not have higher levels of NR in blood when compared with younger subjects. So again, is that true? So for that, we go back to that initial study that looked at blood levels of many different things in the 97-year-olds uh, when compared with their offspring, 67-year-olds, for nicotinamide riboside this time. And for the older group, we can see a 1% higher level of blood levels of NR and a significant, significantly higher levels of NR one, by 1% in the 97-year-olds when compared with the 67-year-olds. So again, yeah, 1% higher blood levels of NR in relatively long-lived people. So, but that raises the, the question, is 1% higher for NR enough to impact longevity? So of these three interventions, glycine with that four to 6% increased lifespan may be the most promising, but is there something better? And I know for most people, the obvious is, you know, to jump out would be CR or rapamycin. I've already covered those in other videos. So let's take a look at something else. And that something else may include bile, bile acids. So an abundance of bile acids are higher in long-lived older adults. So this is data from that same study that compared the uh, blood levels of many different things that were uh, different for the 97-year-olds versus their offspring, the 67-year-olds. And as we can see by this very long list, these are primary and secondary bile acids. The whole list is just those you know, metabolites that are bile acids. So when comparing the 97-year-olds versus the 67-year-olds, you can see that starting from the bottom of the list, glycocholate, the 97-year-olds had a 16% higher blood level of glycocholate when compared with the 67-year-olds. But if you go all the way up to the top of the list, you can see that the longest lived had more than seven-fold higher levels of a particular bile acid known as ursocholate. And if you look at the median on this list, it's about two-fold higher. So ursodeoxycholate, somewhere around 2.1, 2.06 to be specific, uh, in terms of blood levels in the 97-year-olds when compared to the 67-year-olds. So in other words, when looking at all the bile acids on this list, they're not up by a little bit, they're up by a lot. And where there's smoke, there's fire. And what I mean by that is, this isn't one bile acid that's higher in the longest of the group, it's a whole bunch of them. So let's go into the bile acid story more because this, this is their first time appearing on my channel, so it's important to introduce them. So starting from cholesterol in the liver, cholesterol undergoes a series of enzymatic steps to be degraded into primary bile acids, uh, CA, Cholic acid, otherwise known as cholate, and CDCA, which is known as chino, uh, chino or chino or chino, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, but uh, chinodeoxycholic acid or chinodeoxycholate, CDCA. Now, those two primary bile acids can then be converted into other forms, in particular, conjugated with either taurine or glycine 
to form Toro CA, Glyco CA, or Toro CDCA, or Glyco CDCA. Now, note that on this list for uh, blood metabolites that were higher in the 97 year olds when compared with the 67 year olds, each of these four metabolites are there. And again, not up by a little bit in blood, but up by a lot, as much as 2.1 fold higher for Toro Kino Deoxycholate in the 97 year olds when compared with the 67 year olds. Now, these primary bile acids are then stored in the gallbladder and are then released after a meal into the intestine to promote lipid absorption. Now, once these bile acids are in the intestine, primary, bi primary bile acids, BAs, are converted by gut bacteria into secondary bile acids. And there are just a few secondary bile acids that are shown on this uh, car cartoon, but there are many different forms and, uh, that aren't included in the cartoon and that you can see on the list on the left. So just as a few examples of secondary bile acids, we can see uh, DCA, so deoxycholic acid or deoxycholate. And then we can see UDCA, ursodeoxycholic acid, ursodeoxycholate, and LCA, lithocholate. Now, two of these secondary bile acids uh, are on the list. Deoxycholate is 86% higher in the 97-year-olds versus the 67-year-olds, and ursodeoxycholate is, again, 2.06-fold higher in the older group when compared with younger. So how are bile acids related to longevity? Besides the associations that are in the longest live versus shorter live, shorter live, let's have a look at more data for bile acids and how they may relate to longevity. So primary and secondary bile acids are increased in blood from dwarf mice, which have increases for average and maximum lifespan. And that's what we can see here, but we need to introduce what we're looking at in terms of the model. So the model, the dwarf model that we're looking at are lit lit mice, and they're indicated by the black circles. And the lit, lit mice have a mutation for the receptor for growth hormone releasing hormone, GHRH, which as the primary intervention results in 99% reduced circulating levels of growth hormone, but also reduced circulating levels of IGF-1. All right, so now back to the survival data. So we're looking at median survival, first starting with the controls. And note that the median survival for the controls is 30 months which in comparison to other interventions, the control strain is often short-lived, like in the case of alpha-ketoglutarate and berberine, controls were short-lived, so a small extension of median lifespan by those interventions got them to you know, 30 months or a little bit above, but the control strain was short-lived. So in other words, for this study, in looking at dwarf force versus controls, the con control strain was not short-lived as they had an, a, a median lifespan of 30 months. So these dwarf mice have a 23 to 25% increase for average lifespan, including both males and females. And similarly, when looking at maximum lifespan or 10% survival, uh, dwarf, these dwarf mice, the little little mice, also have a 15% increase for maximum lifespan. So now we can return to the original premise of this slide, which is that primary and secondary bile acids are increased in blood from dwarf mice, which is what we see here. So starting on the left, uh, we've got the primary and secondary bile acids, uh, and their concentration in the little mice, or these dwarf mice, lit lit mice, in wild top mice, so normal mice, and then the ratio between the little mice with the wild top mice. So just highlighting three of these primary and secondary bile acids that were on the list for the longest lived human group, uh, and th that's what's shown here, deoxycholate, cholate, and ursodeoxycholate, we can see that these bile acids aren't up by a little in the dwarf mice, they're up by a lot. So for example, deoxycholate is up 3.7 fold, Cholic acid is up 3.5 fold, and urso deoxycholic is up 2.8 fold in the dwarf mice when compared with the wild type mice. And then looking at the total of all of these bile acids, we can see that uh, beyond the three that I indicated, the sum of all of these bile acids on the list are 4.2 fold higher in the dwarf mice that have extended longevity when compared with wild type mice. And again, note that these uh, bile acids, the ones that I boxed, the rectangled, were also higher in blood from long-lived people. So note that this isn't the only animal model where bile acids are increased in association, in association with longevity. So let's have a look at that data. So first, starting with uh, dietary methionine restriction, that's been shown to extend lifespan. And I presented this in, a, in, a, in another uh, video on my, on my channel. So if you're interested, just look up methionine restriction and you will find that data. So just as a quick review, methionine restriction extend light, extends lifespan. So when starting from median survival of the control strain, we can see that uh, methionine restriction significantly increased median survival uh, six points by 6.6% and also maximum survival, as we can see there. Now, liver levels of cholic acid, again, which is a primary bile acid, are increased on a methionine-restricted restric diet. And 
that it's increased in liver, that indica indicates that there's an increase in synthesis of cholic acid. So what are we looking at here? Wild type CD are mice on the control diet on the left, and then WTMR is mice on the methionine restricted diet. And with that green arrow, we can see that mice on the methionine restricted diet have higher liver, le liver levels of cholic acid. So from this, although methionine restriction is the primary intervention, we can see that cholic acid is associated with longevity in mice on a methionine restricted diet. Now, I, to go further, there are more animal models where bile acids are increased in association with longevity. And that's what we can see here by looking at levels of cholic acid in progeroid mice on a methionine restricted diet. Now, progeria is a mouse model of accelerated aging. So for the mouse model of accelerated aging for progeroid mice, that's the G609G, and these were progeroid mice on a control diet, CD. Now note that to start, there are very low levels of cholic acid in these progeroid mice. And then in this study, they fed these progeroid mice meth or, uh, methionine restricted diet or MR. And then we can see that uh, le uh, levels of cholic acid are significantly increased in the progeria mo mouse model. So what's the importance of higher CA cholic acid levels in progeroid mice on a methionine restricted diet? Well, dietary methionine restriction extends lifespan in this progeroid mouse model. So when looking at median lifespan for the controls, we can see that there was a significant increase by 20% in the progeroid mice on a methionine restricted diet, and it close to significant increase for maximum lifespan with a p-value of 0.08 for maximum lifespan. Now, note, again, note that although the primary intervention is methionine restriction, relatively higher levels of the bile acid, cholic acid, CA, is a part of this story. So what about causation? Everything I've uh, sh uh, shown so far for cholic acid is just association. What about causation? Can bile acid supplementation independently increase lifespan? And as we'll see, cholic acid supplementation extends lifespan in a mouse model uh, of accelerated, uh, accelerated aging, or progeria. And that's what we can see here. So in this case, they used a different model for uh, progeria, which is the ZMPSTE knockout mice. So again, this is an accelerated aging model or progeria. And in this study, they divided the mice in two, fed one progeroid pro pro uh, group controlled a control diet, and the second, they fed them with 0.1% uh, cholic acid or CA. And what we can see when looking at median survival when compared with controls, was that there was a 7% increase for median survival in the progeroid mice fed a cholic acid diet. Uh, and in terms of uh, maximum survival, which was 20% uh, survival in this case, so 80% of the colony died, 20% was still alive, this was borderline significant with a p-value right at the border, 0.054. So this then raises another question. Would uh, cholic acid or cholate supplementation in age mice that are not prodroid extend lifespan. And that study hasn't been published yet, so I'm eager to see uh, if slash when that study is published to see if it actually impacts, uh, to see if it impacts aging and not just accelerated aging models. Uh, but it also raises the question, is cholic acid related to longevity in people? And just to refresh your memory, cholic acid was indeed found on that list of metabolites, in particular bile acids that were higher in the 97-year-olds when compared with the 67-year-olds, uh, as shown there. It was 22% higher in the longest-lived group when compared with their offspring, and it was statistically significant, as you can see by the p and uh, p value and FDR, less than 0.05. So this then raises other questions. Will other bile acids besides collate, when considering that long list of bile acids that are higher in the longest-lived group, 97-year-olds, will other bile acids increase longevity in mice, and potentially even people? And if that's true, if cholic acid and other bile acids uh, are able to impact longevity in people, how can, we, how can we optimize levels of bile acids in our blood? What interventions can possibly affect levels of bile acids in, in our blood? And stay tuned for that. I'll have uh, videos on that coming up uh, sometime in the future. So with all this in mind, in terms of bile acids, they may be the next frontier in longevity research, as there's very little press on them yet, but uh, that may change after uh, people see this video. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.